Hello, and welcome into the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show where I talk about the Star Wars Legends line of books. I'm Aaron Motes. Today, we look at the second book in the Darth Bane trilogy, Rule of Two, by Drew Carpishan. But first, I have some quick announcements. Number one, the show's schedule. Uh, the next podcast will be January 28th, and I plan on releasing book episodes every other Thursday going forward. Secondly, I'd like to do a question and answer show. So please send me your questions, uh, Star Wars Legends, Star Wars Canon, anything. Email me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send a tweet at legendslounge1. If I get enough questions, I'll release a show sometime later next week. Now with that out of the way, it's time for today's book, Darth Bane, Rule of Two by Drew Carpishan. Let's head in to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. Rule of Two picks up right after Path of Destruction ends. Bane and Zana are trudging through the jungle on Ruasan. As they walk, Bane begins teaching Zana the first parts of the Sith mantra. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. He asks Zana if she understands how she killed the two Jedi that were with her. Zana says it was an accident, but Bane tells his young apprentice that it wasn't. It was the will of the dark side of the Force. Zana was scared. She was angry, and she lashed out at the two Jedi that she blamed for the death of her animal friend. He says the two Jedi were weak and so deserved to die. Bane says the Sith were also weak, so he had to eliminate them. He decides that he needs to show Zana the results of the thought bomb before they leave Ruasan. In the cave where Lord Khan and the Brotherhood made their last stand, the two find the remains of the Sith and the Jedi that had come to confront them. They also find a floating orb. When Bane touches it, his mind is blasted with the screams of the consciousnesses of the Sith and the Jedi trapped inside. The pain is agonizing, but Bane knows what he's done is right. His actions have ensured the Sith will survive. After they leave the cave, Bane issues a challenge to Zana. He's taking his shuttle and leaving her on Ruasan. She has 10 days to meet him on the planet Onderon. If she does, Bane will train her as his apprentice. If not, he'll have to find another. Bane takes the shuttle and heads to Onderon, but instead of going there directly, he first goes to one of its moons. Dzun is the home of vicious flying predators. It's also where Bane hopes to find the tomb of Freedon Nad and his holocron. Nad was an ancient Sith Lord that lived more than 3,000 years ago. He was a sorcerer who used dark side magics to conquer the Onderon system. The jungles of Dzun radiate with dark side energy, and it leads Bane deep into the jungle toward Freedon Nad's tomb, a black ziggurat that emanates cold, death. Deep in the temple and in a hidden room, Bane finds Freedon Nad's holocron, but he also finds something else. Small, pale crustaceans cover the ceiling above the holocron. Carefully, Bane approaches, and as he takes the holocron from its pedestal, the crustaceans begin dropping all around him. He sprints for the door, dodging as the creatures fall all around him, but he can't dodge them all. Two land on Bane and instantly bite into his chest and back. Bane scrambles out of the temple in agony, beating and pulling at the crustaceans, trying to remove them. But the effort is futile. The crustacean parasites have fused to Bane's body. Back on Ruasan, the remaining Jedi and Republic troops continue to clean up after the battle, landing dropships to deliver supplies. As one four-person squad offloads their shuttle, they spot something curious. A small blonde girl approaches the ship. She's dirty and malnourished and says she needs to get to the planet Onderon. The squad leader decides they'll take her to the Republic Medical Frigate orbiting Ruasan, but as the ship takes off, the girl takes a blaster from one of the supply crates. As one of the soldiers approaches to take it away, Zana pulls the trigger, killing him. She then kills a second member and heads to the cockpit, where the last members of the squad are preparing the ship for entry into the medical frigate. Zana forces the pilot to set the coordinates for Onderon. As the ship jumps into hyperspace, she pulls the trigger and eliminates the last two squad members. 
On Zun, Bane learns from the holocron that the crustaceans fused to his chest and back are called orbalisks. The orbalisks feed on dark side energy, but they're not exactly parasites. They're more like symbiotes. Orbalisk shells protect their host from almost any weapon. They can heal wounds, and they can amplify the host's connection to the dark side of the force. As long as Bane can endure the pain of the orbalisks feeding on him, the benefits are tremendous. But Bane needs to make it to Onderon. He needs to see if Zana is worthy of becoming his apprentice. Bane's shuttle had been damaged when he landed on Zun. However, Onderon and Zun have a unique relationship. Zun's orbit is so close to Onderon that during the summer months, the moon's atmosphere touches and mixes with the planets. With his shuttle damaged, the only way to get off Zun is to tame one of the moon's winged predators and fly through the mixed atmospheres to the planet. When Zana's shuttle arrives at Onderon, the autopilot follows a landing beacon down to the surface. But it's a trap. A clan of beast riders takes her captive and begins to ransack the shuttle. As they begin to take Zana back to their camp, a great shadow dives from above. It's Bane, riding a great winged Drexel. Four of the clan riders mount their beast to engage Bane in aerial combat. But without the Force, the Beast Riders are no match for the Dark Lord of the Sith. Bane and his Drexel kill the four rival winged beasts and eliminate the remaining members of the clan when they land. Bane frees Zana, telling his young apprentice her real training can now begin. The book flashes forward a decade. Bane has now set up camp on the planet Ambria. He's also set up a network of spies and informants throughout the Outer Rim, gathering news on the Jedi and Republic while sowing disinformation among planetary governments. He sends a now 20-year-old Zana to Sereno, a rich planet ruled by several wealthy noble families. There's a large anti-Republic sentiment on Sereno. Zana goes undercover as a low-level employee at the planetary embassy. She infiltrates a separatist cell on the planet's capital of Karania and becomes the lover of one of the cell's lieutenants, a Twi'lek named Kel. Zana convinces Kel that she has information about a secret planetary visit by former Republic Chancellor Valorum. He's coming as an ambassador to meet with some of Sereno's nobility to try to snuff out the separatist movement on the planet. She has access to Valorum's schedule and can give the cell the time and place of Valorum's arrival. Some of the Separatists are wary of the information, but Zana has grown strong in the Force over the last 10 years. She uses her talents to mentally push the Cell members, convincing them to attack Valorum when he arrives. As the meeting breaks up, Zana kisses Kel and leaves, knowing the Cell members will soon be dead. Three days later, Valorum arrives, accompanied by just a small security detail, led by Jedi Knight Johan Othun. As Johan and Valorum exit their shuttle and begin walking across the spaceport, the ship explodes. Four Separatists posing as spaceport employees begin opening fire on Valorum and his guards. Johan jumps to Valorum's defense, but he can't protect both the former Chancellor and the two guards. The terrorists kill the guards, but Johan refuses to allow them to assassinate the former Chancellor. His green lightsaber is a blur blocking blaster bolts while shrinking the distance between himself and the shooters. By the end of the battle, two of the terrorists are dead, while the other two flee the scene. News of the attack spreads quickly across the planet. As Zana plans to leave, she's captured by the remaining Cell members. They transport her to an enormous estate in the country outside of the capital, the seat of one of Sereno's noble families. It turns out the head of the Demichi family, a man named Hetton is the leader of the planet's separatist movement. The middle-aged Hetton begins interrogating Zana, believing she betrayed them to the Republic. As the questions continue, Zana can sense that Hetton radiates dark side energy. He's untrained but powerful. Deciding the interrogation has gone on long enough, Zana breaks free of her shackles, kills three of Hetton's guards, and uses the dark side to invade the mind of another ripping away her sanity. As Zana approaches Hetton to finish him off, the noble drops to his knee, calling Zana the teacher he's waited for his entire life. Hetton gives Zana a tour of his mansion, showing her the dark side scrolls and artifacts he's collected over the decades. 
His prized possession is a data card about a woman named Belia Darzu, an ancient Sith Lord who had lived on the deep core world of Tython. Darzu had discovered the secrets of creating Sith holocrons. Knowing her master would desire this information, Zana and Hetan leave Sereno to meet with Bane on Ambria. When they arrive, Hetan and a group of eight assassins attack Bane, but Zana stands back and observes the fight. The Orbalisks have nearly engulfed Bane over the last decade, growing across his entire body. Only the Dark Lord's head and hands are free. Zana knows she'll eventually need to confront her master to fulfill the role of two, but to do that, she needs to know how to destroy the Orbalisks. Zana watches as Hetan and his assassins attack Bane with blasters, vibroblades, and lightsabers, but none of them even dent the Orbalisk armor. However, the symbiotes seem to react to an electric pulse from one assassin's force pike, shuddering under the shock. Zana takes in all of this information, filing it away for the future. Bane draws on the dark side of the force, enhanced by the Orbalisks. He moves like a berserker, easily slicing through Hetan and the assassins. Full of bloodlust, Bane turns and attacks Zana, accusing his apprentice of trying to kill him. But Zana convinces her master she's still loyal as she holds out the data card, telling Bane the secret of making a holocron is now within his grasp. Back on the planet Ruasan, the Jedi have decided to erect a monument to the fallen Jedi volunteers who stopped the Brotherhood of Darkness ten years ago. Master Farfalla puts Johan in charge of the project, but construction has been hampered by numerous delays. Johan suspects sabotage, and one night he spies a cloaked figure tampering with the construction equipment. Johan surprises the figure and chases him into the woods. The man is quick, but he's no Jedi and eventually Johan catches him. The man's name is Derivit, a refugee from the Ruasan battle. He spent the last 10 years helping others on Ruasan since the end of the war, working as a healer. When Johan asks him why he keeps sabotaging the monument, Derivit tells him the people of Ruasan want nothing more to do with Force users, Jedi or Sith. Johan tells Derivit the Sith are no more, but the man scoffs. Derevit says the Sith survive. He says a Sith Lord left the cave after the battle, accompanied by a small blonde girl. When Johan asks how he knows this, Derevit tells the Jedi he saw it happen, and he knows the blonde girl, his cousin, Zana. Johan decides to take Derevit to Coruscant. The Jedi Council needs to know about Derevit and the Sith. Bane decides to go to Belia Darzu's temple on Tython, but he's not taking Zana. He needs to find a way to remove the Orbalisks encasing his body. They may enhance his power, but they make him too impulsive. After surviving the attack from Hetan, Bane was so blinded with rage he almost killed his apprentice. It would have been a waste. He would have needed to find another one after 10 years of teaching and training Zana. Bane sends his apprentice to Coruscant. If the information on how to remove the Orbalisks without killing the host exists, it will be in the Jedi Archives, the biggest repository of knowledge in the galaxy. Zana is to go undercover as a Jedi Padawan, infiltrating the enemy's temple. She'll need to hide herself in the Force while she looks for the information. It'll be her most difficult and most dangerous test. When Johan and Derivit arrive on Coruscant, the Jedi ask for an audience with the Council to discuss Darth Bane. But Johan knows he can't just take Derivit into the Council Chambers without approval. While the Jedi discuss the information, Johan has Derivit wait in the archives where the man can research herbal remedies he may need on Ruasan. Derivit wanders the stacks lost in thought. Eventually, he looks over at one of the terminals. There, he sees a woman sitting with her back to him. Derivit doesn't know why, but something about her seems familiar. Once Zana arrives at the Jedi Temple, she heads to the Jedi Archives. Her task is daunting. Search through the billions of records for information on how to remove the Orbalisks without killing the host. Zana searches for days and is just about to give up when she spots an entry about a Nikto that had successfully removed an Orbalisk infestation from himself. Finally, she's found it. Gleefully, Zana begins downloading the information, 
when a man approaches her from behind. It doesn't take Bane long to find Beliadar Zoo's temple on Tython. It takes some time to fight through the temple's security system, but it's really no match for the Dark Lord of the Sith. Exhausted, Bane opens the holocron and learns the secrets of making his own. Darzu's avatar tells Bane the process is precise and intricate. It takes time, sometimes months of concentration, to align millions of tiny matrices and infuse the holocron with the knowledge and essence of its creator. Bane is intrigued, but there's no time to study the holocron here on Tython. He needs to return to Ambria to see if Zana has learned how to extricate Bane from the Orbalisks. On Coruscant, Zana and her cousin Derivit stare into each other's eyes. It's been ten years since they last saw each other on Ruasan. As Derivit starts to speak, Zana pushes him into the stacks, covering his mouth to protect her cover. When Zana asks why Derivit is on Coruscant, he tells her that he's been summoned to tell the Jedi about the Sith Lord he saw leaving the caves after the Battle of Ruasan ten years ago. Panicking, Zana knows she has to flee immediately to warn Bane. She can't leave her cousin here to talk to the Jedi, but she can't kill him either. Quickly, she decides to head to Tython and takes Derivit with her. When Johan comes to get Derivit, he doesn't understand why the man is not in the archive where he left him. When Johan asks if anyone has seen Derivit, he learns the man was spotted quickly leaving the library with a young woman. Johan tells Master Farfalla, and after some investigation, the two Jedi learn Derivit and the woman looked up coordinates for the planet Tython deep in the galaxy's core. With the help of three other Jedi, Johan and Farfalla head off in pursuit. As Bane emerges from Belia Darzu's temple, he sees Zana's ship approaching. Confused, Bane confronts his apprentice, asking why she didn't return to Ambria. But Zana stops her master, telling him the Jedi know they're alive. She shows Derivit to Bane and forces her cousin to tell her master everything. When Bane asks why Derivit still lives, Zana says her cousin is a healer who can take the information she's gathered about removing the Orbalisks to heal Bane. Just then, another ship appears on the horizon. The Jedi have found them. The battle is fierce. Bane is more powerful than any Sith these Jedi have ever faced, but still, it's five on two. Eventually, Bane and Zana begin to wear down from the pressure the Jedi keep on them but the Orbalisks enhance Bane's connection to the dark side of the Force. He lashes out with Force Lightning, turning the tide of the battle. Bane and Zana begin cutting down the Jedi, but as the final one falls, the Jedi grabs Bane's leg, wrapping him in a golden cocoon. Bane's Force Lightning reflects back on himself, frying the Dark Lord and the Orbalisks. Now after the fight, Zana and Derivit load Bane's body into her ship. He's barely alive, but the Orbalisks are poisoning his body, emptying a toxin into his bloodstream as they die. Briefly, Zana considers killing her master and becoming the new Dark Lord of the Sith, but no, there's so much more she needs to learn from Bane. Zana and Derivit gather all the lightsabers and head to Ambria. If her cousin can't save Bane, she knows there's another healer on the planet who might, one from Bane's past. Zana lands at Caleb's camp on Ambria, little more than a small shack and fire pit. At first, she thinks the camp's deserted, but she soon finds the healer in a cellar beneath a hidden door. Zana orders Caleb to tend to her master, but he refuses. Caleb says he knew Bane would return one day, so he sent his daughter away, making her promise to change her name and never contact him again. Frustrated, Zana doesn't know what to do. Without the daughter, there's no way to make Caleb treat Bane. However, Derivit steps in. He convinces Caleb to treat Bane on two conditions. First, Zana must send a message to Coruscant informing the Jedi of where Bane is. Once she sends that message, she then has to disable their ship. Once she does those two things, Caleb will try to save her master. It takes Caleb and Derivit four days to remove the dead Orbalisks from Bane's body. When he finally awakes, Zana tells him that Caleb healed the Dark Lord and what the price was. Bane calls Zana a traitor, 
telling her to kill him now and flee before the Jedi arrive, but she refuses. Zahn has been practicing her sorcery, and she has a plan to save them both. Fourteen Jedi arrive at Caleb's camp, and they arrive to a gruesome scene. They find a man's body hacked to pieces from a lightsaber, and hear another whimpering and screaming inside a little shack. As one of the Jedi opens the door, the man leaps out, swinging a lightsaber and howling like an animal. Quickly, the Jedi kill the man and survey the carnage. The Jedi believe the Sith Lord must have gone insane after the fight with their colleagues on Tython. He must have tortured and killed the healer Caleb, and they found him in the grips of psychosis. It's tragic, but there is a silver lining. Now, finally, the Sith have been extinguished from the galaxy. Bane awakes three days after the Jedi leave Ambria and finds Zana finishing repairs to the ship. When the Dark Lord asks his apprentice what happened, Zana tells her master she used dark side sorcery to protect them. After Bane had ordered her to kill him and flee, Zana cast a spell knocking him out. She then killed Caleb and used the dark side to attack Derivit's mind, twisting his sanity and making her cousin's deepest fears real. She then hauled Bane into Caleb's hidden cellar and hid there with him, masking their presence in the Force. When the Jedi arrive, she says they assumed Derivit was the Sith Lord Bane. The Jedi killed Derivit when he attacked them. Bane tells Zana she's done well, but he's curious why she didn't simply kill Bane and leave. Zana says she still has much to learn from her master. But one day, when Bane is no longer of use to her, Zana promises she will destroy him and claim the title Dark Lord of the Sith. Let's take a quick break. When we return, I'll analyze parts of Rule of Two I think are really cool, and if there's anything we might see from this story going forward. I'm Aaron Motes. You're listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. Hey, everybody. Let me take a moment to recommend a book from Star Wars canon, Leia, Princess of Alderaan. The story follows a 16-year-old Leia as she studies to become the heir to her mother, Queen Breha. Join the future rebellion leader as she faces challenges to her mind, her body, and her spirit. But Leia has worries that go beyond the throne. Her parents are acting strangely. They seem to be more concerned with throwing dinner parties than with their daughter's royal training. What are they up to? And why are they being so secretive? Discover it all in Leia, Princess of Alderaan, by Claudia Gray. Welcome back to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. I'm Aaron Motes, talking about Darth Bane, Rule of Two, by Drew Karpishin. Now let's take a look at some of the really cool parts of the book. First off is the character of Darth Zana. I remember liking Zana when I read these books 10, 12 years ago. But going back through them for the second, maybe the third time that I've read the Darth Bane trilogy, it's amazing how you pick up on different things each time you read something. And the more we get a look inside Zana's head, we get to read her thoughts, we get to see exactly how she feels about Bane and how she is so patient. She's playing the long game. She knows that eventually she is going to have to confront Bane in order to become the Dark Lord of the Sith. But she knows that Bane is not teaching her everything that Bane knows. Bane is holding some secrets back. And I love getting the insight into Zana's state of mind at certain aspects of the story. When I look back at some of the characters in Legends that really resonated with me, you know, I don't think the character of Zana resonated as much the first time I read these books. I find her fascinating. I find her more interesting than Bane, 
And I know that Bain is the main quote unquote subject of the trilogy. And yes, I find Bane very interesting as well. You know, I liked in the first book how he figured out that in order for the Sith to rise to rule the galaxy, they had to do it from the shadows. They couldn't be right out in the open opposing the Jedi and the Republic. They had to connive. They had to conspire. They had to sneak. They had to play the puppet master. And I find all that stuff interesting. But, you know, opinions can change over time. And I'm pretty sure the first time I read these books, my focus was mostly on how Bane established the rule of two, established the Sith Great Plan, and enabled the Sith to slowly gain power over the centuries, ultimately to where, in the prequels, Palpatine took over the galaxy. Now, reading it a second time, my focus is more on some of the stuff I didn't pay quite as much attention to the first time. And the main part of that was Darth Zana. Zana is a character that's curious. She's ambitious. She wants to become the Dark Lord of the Sith. But Zana also has these small moments. You know, she understands that in accessing your emotions as much as the Sith do, in order to gain power in the dark side of the Force, it's impossible to only access negative emotions. You're going to experience some positive ones. And there are small moments in the book where Zana feels compassion toward other characters. She's loyal to her master, Bane. She feels empathy towards some of the Separatist cell members on Sereno. She knows that these Separatists are just tools for Bane to sow confusion in the Outer Rim. But there are small moments where she feels for them. She understands that most likely they're going to die. And again, with her cousin Derivit and the healer Caleb, Zana knows the only reason these two men are alive is because they are healers. The dark side of the Force does not offer much when it comes to healing injuries, to healing wounds. That's the reason that Bane left Caleb alive in the first book. But regardless, they're still just being used. And they're expendable when they're no longer of use. Now, there's no part in the story where you think that Zana may turn to the light. She's not going to betray Bane, turn him over to the Jedi, allow them to arrest her, and turn to the light. She's not. She wants the power that the dark side of the Force offers. She wants to be the Dark Lord of the Sith and further Bane's great plan to control the galaxy. But I do think it's cool getting these little moments and insight into Zana's thoughts and feelings. You know, one thing that Legends sometimes gets accused of is not a whole lot of character development. And... In some cases, I can see where that is true. But I think Zana's character has a pretty complex story arc over the second and third parts of the Darth Bane trilogy. And I think on reread, she's become the most interesting part of this book. Now, secondly, there is a lot that happens in this book. I'm not going to lie. The first part of the show is longer than I would like to record. I'd like to try to keep both halves of the show to about 15, 20 minutes. 
But there is just so much that happens in Rule of Two, and so much of it is important to the overall story of Darth Bane. You know, there are callbacks to small things that happened in Path of Destruction that at the time you don't think are important, and they come back to being important in Rule of Two, like leaving Caleb alive, like the fact that Caleb's daughter is no longer there. Remember back in Path of Destruction, Bane basically takes Caleb's daughter hostage, forcing the healer to get the poison out of Bane's system. Well, now when we go back to see him, Caleb has basically banished his daughter from his life, knowing that sooner or later Bane was going to return. We also have Bane's continued fascination with Sith holocrons. And now that fascination has evolved, not only learning more dark side spells, not only learning more about how to grow in power, but now it's how can he develop his own holocron? He knows that eventually he's going to die. So how can he pass along his teachings? And it turns out that making a holocron ain't easy. Making a holocron might be the most difficult thing that Bane's ever tried to do. And there are points in the book where he is trying to make a holocron. All of his efforts fail. Either he gets too excited or he moves too quickly or he just doesn't understand how all of the internal mechanisms of the holocron fit together, both mechanically and spiritually with the Force. So it's become an obsession for Bane, and it's almost as big as his obsession with charting a path for the Sith to eventually take control of the galaxy. So it's these little callbacks to the last book that I really like. And as we'll see when we get to the third book, Dynasty of Evil, there are callbacks from Path of Destruction and Rule of Two that end up becoming important for the climax of Bane and Zana's story. Now, let's get to whether or not we can see anything from this book moving forward in Star Wars in canon. Obviously, Zana. I've already talked about her, how much I like her. If they do anything more with Darth Bane, you know, it'll be fairly easy to show his apprentice, and I would expect them to make that apprentice Zana. If not, I would be disappointed. However, I guess it is possible that if Zana is made canon, she could just be another Dark Lord of the Sith somewhere else in the timeline between. 1000 BBY and Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious. Other than that, there's not really a whole lot in this book that I could see going forward into canon. There are a few things in the book that are are already canon, but those are mostly just planets. You know, Sereno, where Count Dooku was from. We have Tython, which was first mentioned in canon in one of the Star Wars role-playing games. And then in 2019, it entered in one of the Dr. Aphra books, a deep core world that was the site of one of the earliest Jedi temples. And of course, Tython was shown in Season 2 of The Mandalorian, where Grogu was placed on the Seeing Stone trying to connect to another Jedi out there in the universe. I think it's kind of cool that we got another Chancellor Valorum. This one is Tarsus, the ancestor of Chancellor Finnis Valorum that we saw in Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. Now, one last thing before we go. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone that got in touch with the Star Wars Legends Lounge after the first episode. Let's read uh, one or two of those tweets from at Outer Panda. I really enjoyed the first ep, informative and fun, and already wishing I had a backlog of 50 more to binge. Thank you very much for those kind words. And from at Davos Fingers, 
Just listened to the episode while prepping for New Year's Eve festivities and loved it. Thank you for reminding me of the finer points in a series I haven't read in a while. I loved your musings on what could potentially become canon. Looking forward to episode two. Again, thanks everyone for all the positive vibes you guys have sent me coming out of that first episode. Now, what's ahead? Like I said, I'd like to do a question and answer episode sometime next week. Now, you can get in touch with me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or on Twitter at legendslounge1. I'd like to be able to have probably eight to ten questions in order to do a show. If not, then drop me your questions anyway, and I can just read them at the beginning of an episode and just go ahead and try to answer it there. As for a regular book episode, I'll be back on January 28th with the final book in the Darth Bane trilogy, Dynasty of Evil by Drew Carpishan. I'm Aaron Motes. Thank you all very much for listening. And remember, there's always a bit of truth in Legends.